I remember going out there with Arthur Ritchie, the company's driver on the engine, that'd be one of the first times I was ever on the engine. So I had seen the boats there, and it was a favourite thing to do was I'd walk out with my father and uncle to watch the uh, sleeper boats loading. So they were the biggest boats that ever tied up there. They were overseas freighters, and I've seen the sleepers being loaded. And in those days, the very early days on the old jetty, the shipping company had horses. And the horses then would take the trucks out along the jetty and bring the truck back in again uh, because the old jetty was never uh, strong enough to take steam engines. And the uh, shipping company must have found out sometime after the First World War anyway that the new jetty was to be built, but it was to be built way down a mile or so out the other end of town. And there was to be a branch line from the railway parallel with the main line and then turned out to the jetty. So that meant that was the horses would be out of the question once that started. So they bought this uh, shunting engine. I don't know exactly what date it was, but it was in May 1923. And that's, that's when the engine arrived here. Took over from the horses on the old jetty. And then it was used in the construction of the line and the, and the new jetty. And uh, of course, when the old jetty closed then in 1929, it was already working on the, on the new jetty. There was a branch line from Byron Bay Railway Station to the Byron Bay jetty. On that branch line, there was the meatwork siding and uh, other good shed sidings that belonged to the jetty. So when the jetty closed, when the shipping company closed down, that left the uh, meatworks, or would have left the meatworks, with no connection to the railway. So they bought the engine. A.W. Anderson used to send truckloads of meat on the North Coast Mail to Sydney. The Green Frog would bring it up, leave it in the goods yard. When the North Coast Mail come in, after they got the passengers off and on again, they'd back it back onto this truck and pick up the truck behind the brake van, take it to Sydney. Uh, there used to be a lot of traffic come to the railway to go to Sydney by boat and it'd be unloaded at Byron Bay and then the Green Frog would come up with the truck and be loaded onto it, taken down to the jetty. A lot of it used to come from unattended platforms along the way between Lismore and Byron Bay and they also used to take passengers who were travelling to Sydney by boat down to the jetty and they'd let the locals have a free ride if they wanted to. And another thing, if the Green Frog had to come onto railway property, it had to be accompanied by a railway employee. So when they had to go to Norco to pick up truckloads of butter or bacon, the railway employee had to ride the Green Frog, which I did on many occasions, take the key to turn it into the Norco siding, and they had the shutter on the engine. He'd pick up the truck, bring it out, I would close the road again and then ride back to Byron Bay where I'd hop off. At that time, why, uh, why Byron Bay is, uh, stirs up a bit of interest in railway historians is because Byron Bay had three railway systems. In those years they had the main line that opened in 1894 and then the, the, uh, the new jetty line and before that they had the private engine working on the old jetty. And all through this time, from 1904 to the 30s, had the Norco Tramway, which was a completely separate railway system, but it had a junction, a crossing across the main line. And so you had three railway systems all working in the same town at once for, for a period, but from about, uh, well, when the jetty engine came here in 23, up until uh, the Norco Tramway closed in, uh, I think it was about the mid-30s anyway, Byron Bay had three railway systems, a government railway and two private ones. Before they put the big steam trains on the gantry, on the uh, old jetty, they had what they call a derrick crane on the end. It had a steam winch. You had to pull it around by hand. It didn't slew itself around. Many a time, he said, they'd, in the northerly or southerly winds, you know what the northerly are like here, they'd hoist a load up and the man would try and pull it, the crane around on the, uh, on the head rope. And if he didn't let go, he said, you'd be hanging out over the water. Him and others used to say too, he said they were forever last and working on the jetty, there was always something wrong with it. That's the reason why they decided early in the piece to build a new one. Well, originally, right from the very start, the railway only ran from Lismore to Moulin as you probably know. And it gradually crept down to Casino, Grafton. But the most direct route to Sydney was, uh, in the early days, was by, by ship. And so what the railway really linked the three ports, the, uh, to start with, it linked the... Uh, Richmond River Port at Lismore, the seaport at Byron Bay, and then the river port again at uh, the Tweed River at 
Woolloomer, shipping uh, anything to go by boat to, to Sydney, or coming up from Sydney by boat, used to go to one of the ports. The bell on the bar, of course, was, was unreliable, and so was the tweed. So I think that's probably why a lot of freight went in and out through the seaport here at Byron Bay, because it wasn't always opened either. Not the boats couldn't get in, but you just couldn't tie up to the jetty and, and you couldn't sling cranes backwards and forwards if the, if the boat was rolling. And uh, there was always the danger that the boats would uh, get wrecked on the jetty and wrecked the jetty too. So the port of Byron Bay might have been a bit more reliable than the rivers, but it still it was risky in bad weather. But the boats that used to come here were, were uh, mostly built for the rivers. Anyhow, in February 54, when the big cyclone took the end off the jetty, that finished everything. That was the very weekend that the North Coast Steam Navigation Company went into liquidation and it was the weekend that my father took over on the engine. A lot of things happened that weekend. So he was never going to take sleepers or anything else or, or uh, molasses tanks onto the jetty. Uh, that left the jetty uh, useless for shipping because the cranes and all the shipping gear had gone from the end. And I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody got the idea then that they would build a whaling station not over on the terrace in front of the meatworks, but in the paddock beside the meatworks, alongside the railway line, put their ramp on the jetty instead of on the beach, and they'd haul the whales from the jetty into the whaling station with this engine that they just bought, or were going to buy, that uh, used to belong to the shipping company. And that was uh, in February, then uh, the whaling started later that year, the first season started in the winter and they, uh, from there on they used the engine to haul the, the whales from uh, the jetty. And they, they finished in, uh, of course they finished in 62 was the last season, and the jetty just completely fell to pieces after that. According to what I've heard, some of the old ship's captains wanted the jetty built, the new jetty built, out beside the old one and then carry on further out to sea. But the powers that be said no, we'll put it down that end. Well, it might have been still there had it been built up where it was a bit more sheltered, or it might not have either.